Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to another episode of the Instagram Q and A's. You can find the Q and A opening up on Monday mornings, Pacific Standard Time, very early in the morning. They're open for 24 hours at Noah.Kavanaugh. Hit that follow button on my Instagram and let's hop straight into the Instagram Q and A. Question number one, Adidas Copa Sense or Nike Tiempo Legend 9? Now this is a pretty easy answer. Uh, Tiempo Legend 9, 100%. I think the Copa Sense is a good boot, but given the amount of leather, the fit, the stud pattern, basically everything about the Nike Tiempo Legend 9 Elite, I absolutely love. I produced a video on that one. I'll be doing a follow-up with those boots because I think they are absolutely one of the best and most comfortable boots I've worn in a really long time, obviously outside of the current boots that I'm playing in, those Nike Phantom Venoms, which aren't available anymore. So in the case that I go through all five pairs or all six pairs of my Phantom Venoms in the next little while, I will definitely be wearing the Tiempos. They're really light. They're lighter than the Copas. Um, um, I think they have more leather, so they'll be able to mold to much uh, more, more and different foot types. And they also just fit my feet really well. I think they are such a good construction. I love that knit material that acts as basically a fake or, or connected seamless sensation on the tongue area. I think those are both... Uh, Basically every part of, if, if this is not very clear, every part of this boot is far superior to the Copa Sense in my opinion, and it's not even close. Like even, I love the laceless variation of the Copa Sense actually more than the laced version just because of the unique fit and feel. It's a laced football boot, so it feels kind of fun, um, and, it's, and it's fun to wear, but I would wear a Tiempo in training and or in games 100% of the time, and it wouldn't even be a question in my mind. So that's Nike Tiempo Legend 9 over Copa Sense plus or .1 any day of the week. Question number two, worst mistake to avoid when working to go pro? That's a really good question. I think a couple different things that I would just try to avoid. Again, it's not something that you need to be crazy meticulous about. Um, one thing is getting caught into social pressure. So drinking, smoking, that type of stuff. Uh, in moderation, when you're of legal age, having a drink every once in a while is very normal. I know players like myself who have maybe a glass of wine once every other month or once a month maybe, really not that much. And I also know players who don't drink at all. Um, I used to fall under that category. I didn't drink till I was 22. The legal age of drinking is 21 in the United States. Um, but again, like I don't recommend drinking to anybody who's trying to, or, and that, that involves drugs, smoking, tobacco, or marijuana, all that stuff. I wouldn't recommend doing any of those things if you're trying to go professionally, especially if you're underage. That's definitely not something that I think is a good idea. The second piece of uh, that I would really harp on is overtraining. It's really easy when you're young to train, 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 and you never get injured because you're basically always warm, your muscles are ready to go and they're loose. Once you start getting older, it's really easy to overdo your body because you're able to lift heavier weights, you're able to run further, your fitness is higher. Once you get to that threshold, it's a much slower build, right? So you may do this in your fitness, and then as you get older, it's going to go up still, but it's going to be a much slower ascend outside of obviously getting injured and getting back to match fitness. Going from match fit to fittest guy on the pitch is going to be a much slower increase. And that's something just to think about once you get to the higher level, once you've made it to the semi-pro or the professional level, really be cautious about how you manage load and how you manage load on your body. The things that I would look out for are the types of pitches you're playing on. So if you're playing on extraordinarily hard ground, whether that's an artificial ground that's really poor or if that's like Australia has, especially in WA, has a bunch of grass pitches that are sort of deceiving because they're really hard and it's like it's like running on padded concrete essentially. So that's something to think about. You don't want a ton of load on your joints and your bones. Obviously, I got a stress fracture in my bone and had to get surgery. So that's something to think about as well. I would say the other thing to think about is the type of uh, 
load you're putting on your muscles when doing lifting, sprints, and team training. That's a lot of stuff, so you really have to be able to manage all of those different types of loads. I would recommend going and either hiring or working with a professional trainer if you can, or go and get a Zoom call with a professional footballer. Uh, you can go on my website and schedule a Zoom call and we can work through your training schedule, what that looks like for load. And you really wanna make sure that you invest in yourself in making sure that you know you're doing the right things up here, in here, and then obviously for your body and your legs. So overtraining is another one that I would avoid. And then of course, again, avoiding negative thoughts. Like you gotta be positive the whole, obviously it's gonna suck sometimes and I have days like this where I'm like, I do not wanna be training. But oftentimes I find that if I just continue the momentum of my training schedule, those are some of the most satisfying training sessions because I get done with them and I feel physiologically better, my mind feels better and I feel clear. And all of a sudden it's gone from, wow, this sucks to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning and do my, do my thing and then turns into, you know what, but I got it done anyway, and that's better than the guy that's next to me that's not gonna make the team. I'm gonna make the team because not only am I more confident up here, but I'm also more able and fitter in my body. So that's something to think about too. Always stay positive, always stay looking on the bright side of things, even if that means switching opportunities, switching teams, looking for an agent, talking to professional footballers that you know or can connect with, all that stuff is super important. Question number three, most needed qualities for a good center defensive mid. You've got a couple different things. I'd say the first one is passing and ability to break lines. So I'm looking at forward passes, my first touch bounce passes at the same angle and at different angles. I need to be able to hit one outside back to the center back, one center back to the other outside back pretty easily in one touch. Breaking lines, so being able to turn, checking my shoulder, I'm turning and I'm able to hit my number 10 or my wingers pretty easily. That's something that's really important as well. Aerial defensive ability and attacking ability is really good, although aerial defensive ability I would say is probably better. Just be aggressive in the air. Not fouling necessarily because you're a six, but being able to really put your body into somebody if they're trying to win a header and flick it on. Tactically, you have to be almost perfect. So. A number six is responsible for everything that goes on the field. You're the engine. You're the one who is doing all of, all the balls are basically coming through you unless you've got an eight who's doing most of the work. The six's job is to be the pivot. We call it a pivote in Spain. So in those types of four, three, three, even a four, two, three, one, you've got two of them. One player is always that center defensive mid, and it's always their responsibility to make sure that everyone is in their right position, they're defending well. Similar to a center back, they have to know how to call out to the front three, front two, front four, whatever it is, how to press, where to press, what opportunities to take. That's super important. So a CDM's got a really, uh, a lot of good attributes, but they're very specific, again, Think about players like Busquets or Marco Verratti or see Gattuso, like guys who are, yeah, more on the gladiator side or guys like Busquets who are all incredibly technically gifted and also tactically gifted. You've got, or N'Golo Conte, right? All of those guys, the ability to run a little bit. Obviously, Busquets doesn't really have that ability, but he's positionally aware enough to know that, hey, I'm a defensive mid and I can't run as much as a guy like N'Golo Kante can, so I'm gonna put myself in this position as opposed to sprinting out of position, which works for some players and works for doesn't. So you just gotta be able to know those types of things. I'm gonna show you guys or express the probably five or six different things that I would work on in training. In just a sec, I'm gonna grab those. Okay, so I have gotten, this is a snippet into our Zoom calls that we just finished up those eight weeks. So a CDM is responsible for defensive discipline, tactical understanding of the back line and how to assist the gaps. So that's really important when cutting off passing angles in front of your back four. Passing and distribution, both short and long and on the ground and in the air. So you've gotta be able to do all those types of passing really, really well breaking lines of defense with passing, like I mentioned before, movement off the ball. So you've gotta be really good at creating an angle offensively for yourself when your back line or other players has a ball. Aerial ability, 
finding pockets of space in between lines so that your center back can play you the ball or your outside back can play you the ball. And then that becomes, you've broken the defensive line and then you can get out and counter on somebody and then combination play, right? So those are the things that I really think are important when you're thinking about as a CDM, how do I train for this? That's what you do. Question number four, tips for cramps during a match. I assume you're probably younger than me, which means you don't really have an excuse for cramps unless you've got a medical condition that causes cramps a lot. Uh, I'm assuming these are cramps in your leg, not maybe in your stomach or like uterus area. So if you're having like period cramps or something like that, that's different. Um, but if you're having cramps in your legs, your calf muscles, your hamstrings, your glutes, uh, quads, that kind of stuff, or even lower back, stuff to think about. When you're doing fitness, you have to make sure to cool down after every single session. So that means stretching, cooling down, not just hopping straight into a car and sitting in a weird position, thinking about more stretching off the field. You need to hydrate a ton more. If you're cramping at a young age, unless you're playing two 90 minute games a day in a hundred degree Fahrenheit heat, then okay, maybe I get it. You know, that's a lot of sweat you're losing, but salt tablets, uh, there's, I mean, Gatorade even, if you're training or playing for 90 minutes or more, Gatorade's fine during the match and stuff. Just make sure you're getting those carbohydrates, those quick release carbs, the sugar, uh, a little bit of, uh, lots of electrolytes actually, lots of salt, lots of sodium into your body. And then obviously make sure you're doing the correct warm up, the correct cool down and everything should be good. But again, at a young age, I don't think, I think I cramped maybe four or five times in my career ever. And that's just because you gotta make sure you hydrate. By the time I get to the field, I'm peeing clear, right? It's, so it's, you gotta think about it that way, is just make sure you hydrate, make sure you eat bananas beforehand or find a fruit or a vegetable that's got lots of potassium, lots of anti-cramp, uh, anti-inflammatory type properties to it, and then go from there. Final question, how do I practice more game realistic situations at home? This may or may not be possible depending on what type of at-home situation you're talking about. If you're in complete lockdown, I would say start to visualize in-game situations. That's the best you can do for right now. Obviously, if you've got two different wa concrete walls across from each other, you can practice quick dribbling in between cones, play it against the wall, turn, quick dribbling, play it against the wall, that type of stuff. But as far as real games-like situations, if you've got siblings, one-on-ones, one on twos, 2v1s, 2v2s, uh, 3v3s, you know, small sided games are going to be your best bet. Maybe some neighborhood kids can help out with that stuff as well. Uh, bring friends over to the house. If all of that is not available to you, then you're just going to have to work with your, your mind and watch games online. I think, again, game situations at home, if you don't have access to a field, if you're not allowed to actually go out and do game realistic drills or reaction drills or things with cones and stuff that are different colors. It's gonna be very difficult to do proper game realistic drills, but you can always do them up here. You can do game simulations in your head and meditate on them and do visualization work. And then you can also watch games and really understand the types of movement patterns and break down the way that professional players are going. So that's what I would recommend. I'm sorry if that's not the greatest answer only because I'm not really sure if there are ways to get around being at home if you really can't leave home, you can't go to a pitch, you can't do stuff with friends, etc. But if you can do all that, hopefully the first part of that answer was uh, clarifying for you. That's it for the video guys. It was a short Q&A this week. Next week is going to be massive. There's like 15 questions already from next week. So that's gonna be a much longer video. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, hit that thumbs up button. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. As always, be awesome. Take care. I'll see you guys in the next video.